let's do this thing. And uh, and I'm, it says it's live on Facebook, but I do not know. Okay, I'm just gonna try it one more time. Share your new next go live on Facebook. Make it happen. I'm doing it. Try one more time. Just because it taunted me to do so. Something's happening. Go live. Oh, fuck it. Shut it down. All right, let's just do this, ladies. Um, make sure I can see you both. And uh, for those of you, it says it's live on Facebook. So I don't know if it is, but uh, supposedly it is somewhere. It is live, and um, which I'm happy about. How are you, ladies? <laughs> Besides Lauren being cold. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Wednesday. It's like midweek. And uh, thank you, everybody who's tuning into this. This is the fourth episode of uh, Celebrating the Brand Ambassador. And I am here with uh, Lauren Paler and Alex Jump. Um, which I'm very excited about. Um, I'm not excited about, by the way, if you're going to look for new um, uh, healthcare options, don't like hit like you're looking because suddenly everybody and their grandmother starts calling you. Like my phone has literally not stopped ringing and I have to keep putting it on um, uh, do not disturb because so many people are calling me to find out like about my healthcare options. Like I recently found out that there's a new option on your phone that you can forward all un calls from unknown numbers directly to voicemail. Oh, that's fantastic. It's amazing. It's made it a little complicated when people I'm expecting to call me, but I still don't have their phone number and their calls still go directly to voicemail. But it's been really nice. Yeah. Cause I used to get phone calls all the time and now it just like, doesn't even pop up. I'm going to give that a roll. So if you are tuning in, um, you're seeing this is the fourth episode, as I said, and every week we're kind of exploring the role of the brand ambassador. But this week, I really wanted to focus on um, how to build your personal brand, because I think this is something you two ladies have done really, really well. Um, so brands are actually seeking you out rather than the other way around, which is that's where we all want to be in, in life. And then also just talking about some things you've done in your career. So first, I want you to introduce yourself. Um, Alex, just because you're in my screen first. <laughs> Um, tell me like who you are, where, where you work, what you do. Um, hi everyone. I'm Alex Jump. I live in Denver, Colorado. I've been here for almost four years, which is hard to believe. Um, and I'm the head bartender at Death & Co in Denver. So we've been open for a little over two and a half years. Um, although this past year has been a questionable of being open or not being open, but either way, we've, we've been in Denver for a little over two and a half years and, um, I've worked for the company since, since we opened, uh, aside from that, I am one of the founders of focus on health along with LP. She'll talk about it a little bit more as well, but she yeah, and I like started, <laughs> she and I started focus on health, um, basically in March, uh, right at, right around the time that we all headed home and and we're tucked away inside for a while. So she and I have been working on uh, bringing programming and um, <laughs> programming and, and resources and uh, conversations about health and wellness to the food and beverage industry. Uh, and then on top of that, on top of all those things, I'm also the Denver brand ambassador for Seedlip. Uh, I have the garden right here. Um, and, and that's a newer role for me. I've only been doing it officially for a month. Um, and I'm happy to have an opportunity to get to uh, do some good in, in my market and in my community in a time when people really could just use some little moments of joy and absolutely. You know, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So congratulations on the on the new role. You're like you guys are my first like newbies, even though you've been a brand ambassadors, part-time brand ambassadors before. Um, I still think, you know. The great thing is that all the steps you've done in your career, which we're going to talk about, is what's led you to brands like Seedlips seeking you out, which is a great thing. So Lauren, LP. Yeah. Uh, so I apologize ahead of time. I have a little baby uh, pup here who keeps going on my beanbag chair. So if I'm a little <laughs> distracted, that is why. <laughs> um, but yeah, I am Lauren uh, or LP. Uh, I'm based in the DC area. 
one of the founders of Focus on Health. Um, Alex told you a little bit about it. Um, but yeah, it's really a company um, the, where we advocate for health and wellness for food and beverage individuals. And it's been a really crazy wild ride, as I'm sure Alex agrees completely. <laughs> um, you know, what we thought it would be and what it's become it, are, are completely different. But I, I'm really proud of what we've been able to do. Um, aside from that, I am the DC uh, brand ambassador for Seedlip. Uh, so yeah, there so many similarities with the two of us. <laughs> there, there really is. All right. So before we jump into your role about Seedlip, as I said, I want to talk about a little bit about your career path and where you are today. So Alex, you come from Chattanooga, Tennessee, a place where many people have never had the pleasure probably of going. <laughs> Um, where I remember on our conversation before this, you know, you were planning on opening up a restaurant. You definitely had some different plans. Um, tell us about like, you know, what inspired you to leave and like your, and like what steps you've done to like work your way up in the industry. Cause you've done a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I've worked in food in restaurants for over 10 years. Um, I started working, um, as a hostess when I was finishing up high school and, um, you know, and at that time, didn't really think that it was much of a career path for me. I had um, intentions of becoming a, a, maybe like an anthropologist or something like that, maybe a photojournalist. And so I went to school and got my undergraduate degree in religious studies, classics and art history. Um, very <laughs> great, great degrees that, you know, um, when I was getting ready to graduate, you know, I was trying to figure out what I what I was what going to do. What do you do with that degree? Yeah, you just keep going to school, really. Um, <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, until eventually you start, pe you teach people eventually. Um, you know, I thought maybe I would um, travel the world and, you know, take pictures and, and write about it. And to be honest, it's not very different than what my job is now. Um, I still get to travel the world um, and document my life via photography, via social media and uh, write right. a lot about it a lot. And so, yeah, it's really not that different except for there's more alcohol involved than I think I imagined when I was uh, graduating <laughs> college. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I, um, I started bartending in Chattanooga after I studied abroad and my first real job behind a bar was actually in Florence, Italy. And I poured wine and sliced charcuterie and cheese for American tourists at this very large Inoteca in downtown Florence and came back to the US and I really wanted to learn how to bartend. And so I uh, got a job as a bar back, got a mentor. He taught me how to bartend and started bartending around town in Chattanooga. And after a few years of doing that, I uh, really kind of thought that the next step would just be to open a restaurant. And um, I was probably 26 at the time. So I really, uh, I think, realized pretty quickly that I maybe didn't want to own a restaurant before I was 30. Um, Why was that? Why didn't you want to own a restaurant? Um, you know, I think that I just realized, I, as I started to become more uh, enveloped in the industry and getting to travel and meet people, I think I realized really quickly that there was so much more to learn. Um, and there and was, you also, you I know, mean, it's also good to know what you don't want as much as it is what you want and yeah. probably knowing that you wouldn't be able to travel as much as you maybe own the restaurant. You'd be there all the time. Yeah. And, and I don't know if it was that as much as it was just that I realized that I needed more that just because I kind of hit the top of where I could, what I could do working for other people in Chattanooga didn't mean that that was the top of what I could do working for other people in other cities. I just knew that there was more to learn. Um, and so, yeah, for that, that kind of turned into for a while, I was like, oh, I'll never open my own restaurant. Um, while I, while I, when I moved to Denver and worked for other people for a while. And now I'm not, now I'm not so sure. I'm kind of leaning back towards maybe I will, but um, <laughs> well, you were goal oriented. So then I remember you telling me you, you went on your first, uh, you rented Speed Rock, right? Yeah, I went to Speed Rock for the first time in 2016. Um, nobody knew who I was. I didn't know who really anybody was. Um, and I had never even been to one. And I competed um, against a bunch of really cool women. Um, that was back when they did the wild cards um, mm -hmm. in each city. So you could be a wild card from a totally different area. So the wild card for Nashville that year was actually Christine Wiseman from Los Angeles. And she won the whole thing. And I competed against her in the first round. And she uh, she took me out. And 
Um, <laughs> I was, you know, I just was like bright eyed and bushy tailed. I uh, didn't, you know, know what, what was going on, um, but was here. I knew my recipes and um, did okay. And I remember, you know, getting to meet Ivy and, and Lynette and, um, you know, feeling very uh, um, lifted up by them, like just very like um, welcomed into the right. community. And uh, yeah, so then I went, I went home. I was like, okay, well now I know how it works. Now I know what the deal is and I'm going to win next year. Uh, but by that time next year, I had actually just moved to Denver. So um, competed in the Southwest and did win. So yeah, very goal oriented. Which, which yeah, goal. I mean, cause I always say to people like building your personal brand, especially if you work behind a bar, if you don't work behind a bar, don't enter cocktail competitions because brands don't want you. Because uh, or if you even work for another brand, they do not want you. <laughs> that sounds silly, but some people do it, and I'm like, yeah, no, they 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 don't want you. Uh, they want people to work actually at bars so that they can utilize that. But um, to use, do you feel like all the competitions? Because you've entered many. How many have you been in? Um. Oh wow, a lot. Yeah, I don't even know if I could. Um, yeah. So each yeah, more, one, though, probably more than ten. Right. So each one, even if you win or not win, do you feel like it, it just helped you advance in your career or your network? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it. Um, every time you compete, you learn something about yourself um, and you learn more about whatever you're working with. You know, it's an opportunity to expand your knowledge on uh, the product that you're competing with. It's also an opportunity for you to learn more about um technique and speed and efficiency and um and most importantly public speaking skills i mean every time you have to stand in front of people and and speak if it's not if it's not speed rack um mm -hmm. where you actually do have to to speak oh i never bit. thought about that public speaking skills that like it really does. oh yeah. yeah it really does and you know just learning how to present yourself and um and be unique and true to yourself too i think that those are all really good learning experiences to develop who you are and make a name for yourself no, absolutely. And, and um, the, the last question, and then definitely uh, diving into LP, uh, who is distracted by her puppy, who's chewing everything. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't look like a puppy, by the way. I saw a post of him today. He's huge. Um, <laughs> uh, but you also, you know, you, why did you move to Denver? I moved to Denver for a handful of reasons. Um, I have family that live here that have lived here for, um, they've lived here almost 10 years. So um, I already had been visiting um, and had, you know, a few years under my belt of coming to Denver once or twice a year and getting to know people in the industry, kind of feeling like I already had a community. Um, I was really inspired by the food and beverage industry here. Every time I came to visit, it was so exciting to, you know, see what cool new restaurants were going on. And there was just so much more um, like dynamic food and beverage options than what I had at home. And that's true for like literally any city, but Denver's just the one I was sure. visiting Did at the time. Did you have a goal, the death and company? Yeah. So the, yeah, the final kind of the icing on top of the cake of really the kicker for why it made sense for me was that I wanted to work for death and co. So I knew that they were going to open. Um, but I was a little early. I moved to Denver about a year before they were even ready to start hiring people. So um, hung out for a while. But I, yeah, like I, like you said, I'm goal oriented, and I set the goal for myself. I wanted to be the bar manager. I wanted to run the bar program there. Um, and so I spent about a year uh, working towards that goal, which was a really anxiety inducing thing to do, quite honestly, because there weren't tangible, um, achievable things that you could knock off of the checklist to <laughs> right. achieve that goal, because it's not like there were rounds of interviews to do. They were, they had literally had a hole in the ground when I moved to Denver, they <laughs> were building a brand new hotel. So they, yeah, it was just more like waiting around and um, being anxious about getting hoping it, it worked um, out. and hoping it worked <laughs> out and it, and it did. That's fantastic. And Lauren, so Lauren, you have, you moved from the Bronx to DC to go to nursing school, very admirable yeah. uh, position. I have many nurses in my family. And then your entire career trajectory changed when you met Derek Brown and were hanging out in the Columbia room. Um, so tell me what has made you fall in love with the industry and like a little bit about your steps you did to like get your, move yourself up in the restaurant. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I used to go to the Columbia Room and the Passenger in 2013 and 14 a lot because one of my really good friends was working as a server. 
Mm -hmm. So what I would do is, um, you know, we would finish school, we'd eat dinner, we'd go to the Columbia room and the passenger, she'd work her shift. And then I just do my nursing labs and homework. I put some headphones on, I drink like a Mexican Coca-Cola, eat my chicken sandwich and just rock out like eight hours of work. Um, and, you know, I think first and foremost, the thing that really just made me love the environment I was in was how hospitable they were. Mm -hmm. Because I can think of many instances where, you know, had it been anywhere else, I'm sure they would have been like, ma'am, you got to leave or like, hey, you're taking <laughs> up the table, like you can't be doing this, you know. So um, the fact that they were just so nice and hospitable and always made me feel comfortable was most definitely a reason why I was intrigued by the idea of being on the other side. Additionally, honestly, just having a moment to really get to know people and learn what it is they were doing. I mean, I can distinctly remember being at the bar and just hearing Derek talk about spirits and cocktails like he was a professor. And I was like, wait a minute, this is so cool. Like I've never <laughs> had anyone speak to me about, you know, like drinks this way. So I think then is when I really realized, you know, there's a lot of craft and care that goes into the product. And I was like, you know what, I want to do that. Yeah. So completely left nursing and was like, all right, what do I have to do to be able to do that? And we, you know, luckily when I was working at Etheridge very early on, they had a program where, you know, you would get your intro some, you'd get your Cicerone, you'd, um, you know, learn your steps of service, you'd become familiar with all of the styles of everything, you know? So that was um, part of their, pro their training program right off the bat? Yeah, they had a really great training program. And, uh, you know, I ended up doing things that I realized, because I've, I've only been bartending five years. Right. So I realized that, like, early on, I was doing things that I guess a lot of other people weren't necessarily doing. Like, I went to bar five day. I didn't pass, but I won. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did things. And I was exposed to situations where... Um, you know, I think I very early on was able to really set myself up for success and bar five days. Sure. Did you get your bar back? Cause you really wanted to bartend and you like, oh, yeah, I ended bartending. up bar backing. So I started out as a bar back and a server. Cause I was like, you know what? And I didn't know any better. I know that there's like this negative, like, like association with that position. But I think if anything, being in a position where I'm, I have full knowledge and understanding of every role just sets me up for success. If I'm the one ultimately being in a position of management, like how else can I show you or tell you how to do your job if I don't even know how to do it? Yeah, um, no, I totally agree. And I also, I think it gives, says a lot about your character, the fact that you're willing to get dirty, do the work and put it behind. Cause I think there's so many people today I meet and they're like, oh, I wouldn't do that. They Dude, just put me behind a bar anytime, anyone. Yeah. So if you can fly me anywhere, I'll be your bar back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it says a lot because there's sometimes people and, or they don't stay at jobs. I, I mean, a lot of young bartenders these days and they, they're constantly moving from job to job. Um, and these days, obviously everybody's lucky to have one job. Um, but, and it's like, and I'm like, why? They're like, yeah, well, it kind of interrupted my like social life. And like, I had to work too many days and I'm like, that's called a job. Like you just do the <laughs> job. Like, yeah. And I was like, you know, this says a lot about you. It's like, you know, sometimes you got to get dirty. And sometimes, I mean, I remember volunteering, like Dale DeGroff, he was my, when I took bar five, it was 2005. I was in the first class and I just wanted to do whatever I could to learn about cocktails and everything else. So I, I would volunteer to be anybody's bar back all the time. I was like, can I just volunteer to be behind your bar? Can I, I'll just help you. I'll lug boxes just so I can learn. Um, and that says a lot. And Alex, to your point about entering all those competitions, entry, and I know, uh, Lauren, you've entered competitions too. Like it takes time. It takes effort. Like that's yeah. not just something you really have to spend some time and effort to do your videos, to do your presentation, to prep your cocktails. And that says a lot about both of your characters that you're willing to put in the extra work because you know, it's going to have benefits later on down the road for sure yeah this actually reminds me of this one time I was having a conversation with somebody about bar backing um there was like an instance where somebody a bartender was like upset about having to work a bar backing shift this was years ago um and the woman I was talking to she said the most poignant sentence I'll never forget it she was like you know at the end of the day you've got to get your own ice and it's like about just like you can't be too good for a job like if you need ice 
and your bar back's busy. Like you're going to have to go get your own ice. And it was just kind of just this like perfect moment, perfect sentence, like, just like, yeah, you're not too good for any job. And yeah. I would just like, never forget that. My, my dad, I came from a working class, you know, family and my dad had five jobs when I was growing up. Uh, and one of them was a janitor. He was a janitor and uh, a fireman, a gardener, a chauffeur, uh, hours, but still like he had so That's many jobs, cool. right? There was eight of us. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, and I was never embarrassed about it. He said, Elaine, as long as you're the best janitor you possibly yep. can be. And he's like, if you imagine you're a shitty one, he's like, and this is a job doesn't, you know, he's like, it doesn't require me to think that hard. So I want to be the best one I can be. And I was like, I always admired that about him. And I always admired about anybody I meet who just does the best they can do. And these days, I think you're the person people are going to hire because you multitask as well. You're willing to put in the extra effort. You're willing to go way beyond. Which says yeah. a lot about you guys, you ladies, as your personal brand. I'm sure people know that about you. And they're like, oh, yeah, she shows up. Yeah. I also knew that uh, with, you know, and hey, we're going to get real, real here. My mom is African-American. And <laughs> there was no way I was going home, quit nursing. Right. <laughs> and not being the best bartender I could possibly be. <laughs> I can imagine so. I, I don't even know. It even matters what grace you are. I think it's like your parents be like, you did what? Like <laughs> exactly. Alex, you said you you're not going to like using your degree. Your parents were like, but they were supportive, but still you were like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it definitely took them like a little bit of time to like warm up to it. But yeah, I mean, like imagine you just like finished three and a half years of going to school and you know, my parents paid for it for me and I'll forever be grateful for them for uh doing that for me and making sure that I don't have student debt. Yeah. So at the end of that three and a half years to be like, Hey, so I know that y'all just paid, you know, money for me to go to college and get this degree in religion, but I'm going to explore bartending. And <laughs> like, they're like, what? Like what? now they're like, they're so cute. you like, I, you can't take them anywhere without them mentioning to the bartender that their daughter I love is that. Oh, that's so yeah. sweet. Oh, <laughs> I was actually, I was um, back home in the end of October and stayed one night in Nashville on the way back to Denver and went to Attaboy in Nashville. They had just reopened and um, <laughs> the bartender, um, we were, we got to talk and whatever. Yeah. I live in Denver. I'm the head bartender at Death and Co in Denver. And he was like, Oh, I met your parents last year. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. They were bragging about you. That's so yeah. sweet. Um, so you guys, you know, you ladies are both goal oriented people. So, um, when Laura, when I talked to you, we were talking on, on Monday, you were saying, you know, you didn't have exactly goals going like years ahead, but in each job you had a goal of like what you were going to do. So tell me a little bit about that. Like in each job you did, you know, up to now, like when you started in time, like you had a goal in yeah. that job, in that role. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when I did the transition from nursing to uh, hospitality for me, I was like, you know, I just want to be the best I can be. And I need to figure out because with any job that you're changing or any career trajectory mm -hmm. that you're changing, it really takes a while to familiarize yourself with what the certificates and the accreditations you are, it, that you need in that respective field, what, you know, what the do's and the don'ts are. And that took a while. So in every job I had, when I felt that I had, um, you know, gained the skills that, for, that were necessary to be very successful in that position, I, you know, made a new goal for myself. So at Eat the Rich, it was like, I want to learn all of my classic cocktails, be familiar with wine, beer, and spirits, and be able to manage a team um, that, you know, is successful. And then I want to go on to do something else. And then I transitioned to Kimpton, where I, I got some hotel experience, you know, managing in-room dining, as well as being the bar manager for the Palomar in D.C., so then I was like, you know what? It's time for some fine dining experience and worked at the Dabney uh, Michelin star. And it was, I mean, every experience was just so different. And then along the way, I figured out what I like, what I don't like, you know, and what each experience provided me an opportunity to say, okay, what could I potentially see myself doing in the future? Because I mean, ultimately we all want an end goal, right? Yep. Um, no, so but it yeah, does drive I'm, your decision. So yeah, I think- when you have a goal, it will change what you focus on at that time or at that position. So suddenly you'll be like, okay, I have a goal. So I need to meet with this person. I should ask these questions. 
you know, it, it kind of changes your, your conversations. It changes, you know, what you're spending time on um, so that you can get to that goal. If you have no goal, if you just enter a job, I'm just coming in every day and I'm just going to, you know, do my job. I'm going to go home and you have no future like goal, even just for a year. I always say that question, like, what do you want to do in five years? Uh, Cause I was like, I don't know, um, you know, but I, I want to be employed. Uh, I want to have, you know, and then I understood as I got older, I'm like, I understand because it would change my decisions and the education I would ask for or things I wanted to do. Like when I wanted to be a mixologist, I knew exactly who I needed to ask. I knew I needed to go to bar five. So I started asking those questions. Um, so I think that's the point I just want to drive home is that anybody looking to get into being a brand ambassador or any career in your life is that, you know, you do need to have goals. It just, they could be short term. It just could be for the week. It could be for the month, but just having a little bit, whatever job you're in, this is what I want to get out of this particular job. And then when you hit it, you can be like, all right, I can move to the next thing now, um, or whatever that is. And Alex, um, you also had goals. You said to me, I asked if you entered competitions to build your brand. You said not at first, but eventually that became something for you. You're like, you wanted to get your name out there and then you had a goal to come to work for Death and Company. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I think when I first started entering competitions and, and traveling a little bit, it was mostly just because like I was saying to you on Mondays, like I just worked in such a small market that we didn't get the opportunity to do a lot of things. We didn't have like brand ambassadors that lived in town. Um, you know, no brands were really spending money on us there. So it was like, by getting to go compete, I was like getting to do these things that people were doing in bigger cities because I was, you know, if I, if I won or if I did well, I would move on to the next round. It meant I got to go somewhere else and like kind of have a cool experience and meet people, mm -hmm. which I didn't get to do before. Um, and then as I started to do uh, well in them, you know, I did realize that that was definitely a way for me to make my name known in the industry and, and you know, I set personal goals for myself of, you know, wanting to be recognized as, as somebody who is a, a great bartender in the United States. And um, I think that for a long time, I almost was like ashamed to even say that out loud because like, you know, wanting, wanting something good for yourself or like wanting to be uh, well-known and we always are like, oh, it's not supposed to be about ourselves. So hospitality is not about us. Um, and it's not, but you're still allowed to want to, to be yes, great. You are allowed you know? to dream and dream big. As I always tell yeah. people, I was like, <laughs> fuck the industry because we're all embarrassed we're like oh like i i don't want to oh, think yeah. it's bragging i'm doing this amazing thing and like oh i might be bragging and i'm like i've learned i made bad decisions by now talking about some of the things that i've done in my career yeah. and it you know i should have yeah and well you know and i think that it all kind of came to a, a head in the the last competition that i did when i did mib because I was able to really kind of take a step back and ask myself some really important questions that I hadn't asked myself before, which really kind of tied into um, to focus on health and why it came about in the first place. Because I, the question I asked myself when I competed in my B was, why do you want to be the best? Um, why is it important? And, um, and then on top of that, like, if you're going to be the best, like, then you should be able to be around, right? Like you should be healthy and happy mm -hmm. and be able to be in this industry. Um, it's not like a, you know, it's not a goal you want to destroy yourself along the road to get to you. And so then I, I realized um, as I was doing these competitions that not only was I getting to be in front of people and introduced to people and, and made my name known, but I also had a very loud voice that would be heard. Um, that is so important and valuable. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it truly is like free PR for you um, if you want it to be. And you can really create a mission for yourself and, and uh, let it be heard. And that's what I did with MIB. Uh, which, is, was, which is very admirable. Like, you know, you're using your platform for good and, and promoting it. And we're going to talk a little bit about using platform because I know you use Death and Company platform as well. Um, Lauren, I know you've also entered some competitions. Um, you had the cognac one. You also entered, I think, world class. Yeah. yeah. What was yeah. your inspiration? Like, wh why did you want to enter those? So it's interesting. I, I would say before 2019, I did like one or two. The first competition I did was Copper and Kings. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, for me, it was like, oh, I don't want to do this. This is so like not 
like aligned with what I do as a bartender and it's making me so uncomfortable and it's scary, but I did it and I won <laughs> regionally and I got to travel and I was like, this is cool. And, you know, I think back fast forwarding, there were like three years between the first time I did it and then again, doing it. And it wasn't until I competed in the, the DC, Maryland, Virginia, black restaurant week competition and won that I was like, this is awesome. It was an amazing experience. <laughs> it is always um, better when you win. <laughs> yeah. You know what I think it really was? It was all of the investment. Like I really cared about what they were attempting to accomplish. So I think if you're invested in aligned with what their mission is, it really makes the experience that much more um, enjoyable. Yeah. And then additionally, for me, I really think it was, it really helped bring me out of my shell. I mean, I don't, and I still don't think a lot of people know I am and that's fine, but I don't think until I did world class right after that, that anyone really knew who I was. Um, and had it not been for that competition, I would have never applied to world class. So, you know, competing in something like world class where I was very novice, at least I, I think I was in comparison to everyone who was there, um, way more experience had competed in world class, you know, many times before uh, 2019. And I mean, everyone was so nice. I expanded my network, my, my networking, mm -hmm. and I just met people who like knew other people that I knew or like, just, you know, they had known who I was. And it, the, I, the experience is so hard and difficult to explain, but it's mm -hmm. so rewarding. Um, no, I, I absolutely. Say, absolutely. Yeah. I was gonna yeah. say, no, it is it's such an award thing. And it's so weird, because in Europe, Competitions are like normal. Everybody goes and enters competitions. When world class, I, when I was working with Diageo, world class in the United States, nobody entered. It was like pulling teeth. Everybody's like, yeah, why? Why Why do I need to do that? And I was like, I don't know, to be the most famous bartender in the world. Like, you know, I was like, yeah. you can write your own ticket if you win world class. <laughs> I mean, you get flown around, you become the brand ambassador, you get book deals. Like, they're like, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. But I don't even think I did it for that. I honestly think it was like, this is an experience. Going back to goals for me at that point, I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to win. I don't even think I'm going to make regionals. And then I ended up being in finals, which is crazy. But I was like, you know what? This experience for me is going to push me to like be a little bit more uncomfortable. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. No, and I think, uh, no, being on, learning how to be uncomfortable is such a valuable skill because it happens often, you know, in, in life. Like, I'm uncomfortable every time I do this Facebook Live because it's <laughs> always a shit show. Like, I, I it, it, like, makes me uncomfortable because I'm like, oh, I don't, un like, the technology of it, and I'm trying to figure it out. And I'm like, people are going to just be like, oh, she's so old. Why does she not know how to do that? Like, you know, like, these are the things I think about, right? Um, and, but it is uncomfortable. And Alex, you said something to me um, when we talked, it was something about learning how to fail um, that you thought was a very valuable life lesson. Tell me a little bit more about that. Like, when did you learn that lesson? I'm so, I mean, I'm still not comfortable with failing. Um, <laughs> and I'm so, I'm so competitive. So the, um, the competition part's hard for me because so like, failing for that feels so, um, physically it makes me physically ill um to compete um because i that that weird like fear of failure the really manifests physically for me mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean like you gotta you have to learn to fail in every part of your life and um yeah i had i had this conversation with alex day maybe about a year and a half ago or so he was in denver and we were just checking in and i was like one thing that i've really struggled with when learning to manage is learning to manage people and, and to have empathy and, and to understand um, how to manage people differently. And that's really hard. And so I always kind of like, what I think what I was saying to him was that like, I just, just like when, sometimes when you fail on that level, when it's like interpersonal communications and relationships, it's like, you feel like there's like, you lack so much grace. Like there's just like, <laughs> you know, like that. And that's really like a tough thing for me. And so I was saying to Alex, you know, it's just like really, tough. I just feel like I really lack this grace when it comes to trying to manage people and, um, and having those interpersonal relationships. And he was like, you know, we're always going to fail, but it's always important to make sure you're failing forward. And yes. ever since he said that to me, I've been like a little bit more okay with failing because I know that like, if you don't fail, then you'll never, uh, you'll never take you chances that you, you don't grow. Yeah. You definitely don't grow. You know, it's like my, my best learning experiences from managing has been when I royally, you know, fucked something up, like 
pardon my language, but like, you know, it's just like you say something you really shouldn't have, you know, shouldn't have said, or you don't react to something that you really should have reacted to. There's been a lot of things like that, that have happened that, especially with death and co. And, you know, especially in this last year where, you know, I, have the hindsight of being able to be like, wow, I really should have done this um, in that situation. And that's and so, a great thing. It's because you are learning from your mistakes. And if you're able to go back and maybe apologize to somebody or say something like, you know, it, that's a great manager. Like, you know, yeah. why would you yeah. know how to manage? You're learning how to do it as you're, as you're going. It's not something right. a lot of people teach. Exactly. So yeah, I'm a big fan of, of failure and, and learning from your mistakes and, um, you know, the greatest manager is the person who can learn from their mistakes, admit that they made a mistake, um, you know, and, and move forward and learn from them. So, um, yeah, failure is not a bad thing. And when it comes to, you know, like work, it, we always feel like it's so, uh, cut and dry or like, you know, it's like, oh, I made one mistake. I hope, hope I don't get fired. And it's like, right. you gotta learn to, you know, it's like everyone makes mistakes. Like, I think the biggest thing when you make a mistake is also owning up to it. It's something I yeah. teach my, my 15 year old daughter from like, you know, I was like, if she, she did something wrong, I'm like, I'm not gonna get mad at you. I get mad at you and you deny that you did the thing. I was like, but when right. you say, mom, I fucked up and I did this thing, like then we can have a conversation about it. I was like, and I think that's true in all of life. There were many times in my career, I should have been fired or I, I fucked up royally. And my boss, I knew, and I was like, and I knew if I got ahead of it and I sat down, I was like, yeah, I fucked up. Like, this is the thing I did. They were like, all right, let's like, let's figure out how we can fix it. But if I try right. to hide it or whatever, like that was a lesson I learned uh, pretty early on, like, oh, this is a good, if I could kept doing it, obviously, eventually they would have to be like, all right, as long as so many times we can forgive you, but it's like admitting it, learning from it and moving on. Yeah. That's part and of life. It's part of life. So I just want to go back to goals for one thing. So do you ladies have any go Like, what are your goals for 2021? I'll start with um, you. Yes. Yeah, you want me to go? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, it's so funny. I've always been such a goal oriented person. And then like 2020 happened. And then I just like, I almost just like <laughs> know, zoomed in question. on like tomorrow. Um, you know, for 2021, I, um, I w personally would like to, um, to do some focus on health activations at, uh, some cocktail conferences. Um, LP and I and our team have been having some conversations about what that might be. And so that's definitely one thing that I would like to see happen. Um, Great you know, personally, I'm, I'm going to take some personal vacations that don't have to do with work in this coming Good year. And that's you. a big, a big goal for me in the coming year is to continue to explore who I am outside of work, because that was really something that I started to discover in this past year and, and explored more in 2020. So that'll be continuing. Uh, I'll give you one word of advice when it comes to taking uh, vacations. Uh, if you start taking them at the same time every year, it makes your life a hell of a lot easier. Like just yeah. always schedule it. So then you could just yeah. book your life around it. Yes. Yeah. Well, my parents always do vacation, like literally the week before tales of the cocktail, which I've been like, can we some other time? Like, is there, but you know, they've always <laughs> done it then. Like they don't care that that's when that is. So yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I think for one of my big things in the past year has just been that realization that like work comes and goes and, and work can be very important and you can be very passionate about it, but nothing uh, makes up for the, the time spent with your family and, and your, your close, uh, the people Absol close to you. Absolutely. Um, I think that's such a valuable lesson. So Lauren LP. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> oh, there's a dog. <laughs> Yeah, this guy is driving me a little crazy right now. Um, Dozer. <laughs> that's a big dog. That's not a puppy. <laughs> he's cute. Oh my God. He's a horse. <laughs> um, so I think for me, for 2021, uh, very similarly with Alex, I think a little bit slow expansion of the focus on health, um, really just trying to um, make that transition from virtual events to in-person events. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, you know, I think, I don't know. I think maybe, yeah, all additionally spending or finding ways to connect a little bit more with people that are meaningful to me, uh, whether that be family or friends. Um, I think that I spent so much time really trying to figure out how to take care of myself in 2020 that 
Um, there are some relationships and friendships that I didn't necessarily make a lot of time for. And, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I, I would like to figure out a way to be able to incorporate, um, you know, ways. Uh, <laughs> I'm so distracted by it. Um, incorporate, um, you know, uh, some, some more realistic ways of uh, maintaining those uh, in a healthy manner in 2021. No, I think those are great. It is not, it's not easy. And as you get older, it's not easy. It's, it's even harder, especially when you put family and everything else in, into the, into the mix. But uh, yeah, I think it's okay that, you know, trying to make sure your life is okay this year was a big thing. And then I, I try to schedule, like, you know, I try to have a day, like, okay, Friday is my day. I, I literally have on my calendar, like, I'm going to make, I schedule like two or three hours for personal calls on Friday, like late Friday afternoon. Cause I know everybody else is in the same mindset. Like I'm done working and I don't want to have that, but it, it is very hard. I find myself, uh, you know, Philip time remind me, he's like, Hey, you haven't seen your friends in a while. You should go and check in on them. <laughs> um, which, it, it, which is really, really in, important. So, all right. So you guys both met a few years ago, you were part-time brand ambassadors for uh, a whiskey uh, company. And now you've come together for, uh, I almost, almost wanted to say front of house, for our health, because you stuck that in my brain, uh, for your health. Um, so what is the what is the mission? If you want to explain to somebody what front of uh, for your health is about, who wants to? Well, Alex, I'm actually gonna, gonna let you explain focus on health because I feel like you that you have it like down. Okay. Um, yeah. So the the main mission for focus on health is to help people that work oh, I'm in saying hospitals. it wrong focus on health not it's okay <laughs> <laughs> it, you know health. health health and most people just focus say front of health. house and we're like yeah <laughs> um <laughs> um yeah our you know our main mission is our, that we want to help people that work in food and beverage find ways to have long lasting healthy careers in this industry mm -hmm. so our our belief is that that is possible but that currently our industry has not created support systems to make that possible. So it really came about because I was competing in most imaginative bartender and they're the competition's really incredible because they don't want to sure you can make a great drink. Everybody competing can make a great drink, but that what they really want to know is what drives you and what motivates you and what, um, what is your creative outlet? What do you, how do you find release? What inspires you? And so when I entered into the competition and this really kind of like circles back to what I was saying about like learning who I am, um, I was really intimidated by that question because I didn't have an answer. Um, you know, I was like, cocktails inspire me, food and beverage inspires me. I work, <laughs> I work 70 hours a week. Like my work inspires me. Um, and I was like, well, that, I know that that's not what they want to hear. Um, you know, and I didn't have like, you know, I'm not a painter and I don't take photography, you know, I don't take pictures as much anymore and all that. So, you know, I was just like, well, I, I don't know. And that really is where I kind of came to this answer of, you know, what inspires me is this industry and it is this community. And so my creative outlet is finding ways to help people have long lasting and healthy careers in it. Um, and so that was my platform for the competition. And, and I literally said, every time I was in front of judges making drinks, I would, you know, I said to them, like, we're all here trying to be the best. We want to be the best bartender, but what is the point of being the best bartender? If you fucking die, if you, if you die along the way, and I'm tired of seeing people in our industry suffer from mental health issues, substance abuse issues, mm -hmm. um, just anxiety, depression, um, you know, everything, the whole gambit people that we love actually dying yep. because they don't have the resources to take care of themselves because there's so much shame and stigma surrounding anything to do with your mental health, anything, especially in our industry. If you um, have a, a drinking problem or a substance abuse problem, there's so much shame and stigma around that in our society in general, but imagine, you know, working in food and beverage and having mm -hmm. an issue like that. And um, I'm tired of seeing that happen. I don't believe that I don't believe that it needs to be that way. And so focus on health is here to start having those conversations because they're difficult conversations to have that a lot of people don't want to have. And that's the biggest part of the problem um, yep. is that nobody's having them. And so when somebody dies, it's always the same thing. It's, we didn't know that they were struggling. We didn't know that they had a problem and that's just not acceptable anymore. It shouldn't be that way. And it, we need to change our community so that 
that isn't the case. Um, so at Focus on I Health, we, <laughs> yeah, no, I so think that, that's amazing. And Lauren also said you guys are also, because obviously you didn't go to school for that and Lauren didn't go to school for that. But, right. So the one thing I, because I asked Lauren and, and Lauren, like you are bringing in experts as well to educate yourselves and also to educate others, correct? Yeah, right. so, yeah, that's the thing. It's like we acknowledge that we're not we're we're bartenders, right? And we have passions that align with obviously what it is that we're um, uh, preaching with focus on health. But I think the thing that's really important and one of the elements that really strongly exists with focus on health podcast with Alex is that she brings and she has conversations with people inside the industry and outside of the industry, and that translates throughout everything we do. You know, whether we're talking about physical health or social health or uh, environmental wellness or, you know, whatever it may be. I think that it's really important to ensure that we have individuals who are actually accredited and have the training that align with what it is that we're trying to provide everyone with, whether that is a tool or a program. Right. Which, which I think is, is really important because I know a lot of people have really good intentions and they, they want to go forward and they want to promote certain things. And I'm like, I hear you and I feel you, but you don't have the accreditation. So you might say something that's not exactly right. That might be doing more damage than good. So it's always good to have, to recognize that. And then, then bring in the people who have the accreditations. And then I'm sure you guys, your education is kind of keep evolving over time and you will be, become more of those experts. That's able to be able to put that information out there in the world. Um, because you're right, this industry does need that. And I think it's really incredible. And it's probably why, I mean, it, it does align now with your Seedlip uh, program, right? So now you guys are, ladies are both part-time brand ambassadors for uh, Seedlip. So tell me a little bit now, you, you both started in November, but they, and you were doing front of house, uh, sorry, oh my God, focus it's on okay. It's focus okay. Focus on our health. Focus on health? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Focus on you just say F O H. F O H. Uh, F O H. Uh, I know Lauren, you really dove into it this year. But how long has the company been? You've been doing this. F-O-H? Almost a year. It's crazy. Yeah, almost a year. Almost a year. Yeah. So, were you doing it before Seedlip came and found you? So I reached reached Seedlip. I applied for the job in March. Okay. And I was supposed to, I was, I, I received the position and I was supposed to start in March and then everything happened with COVID and that's when Focus on Health started. So um, we've actually had the great privilege of being able to work with Seedlip throughout the last couple of months and um, full circle right back to present day. Really exciting that, you know, we're both now obviously employed with Seedlip and that we can still create programming and everything kind of just flows really nicely. Do you think that helped kind of seal the deal? <laughs> um, maybe. I think, I mean, when, we, when I think of Seedlip and what it is promoting and what it stands for, it does really align, a lot, a, a nine, hear me, I can't speak, align very nicely with what we're doing. And I think because it's so authentic and it's very like, not, it's a very natural fit. Um, I, if I was, you know, someone looking for, um, people to work for me I probably would look for something very similar um but yeah it's really exciting I'm I'm just really happy to be in the position I'm in yeah no and and Alex for you I mean because this you started a, a little like well you guys both ladies both started it this year um and you were using your platform did CLIP did you apply for the job or CLIP came for you looking for you uh, I did not I didn't apply for the job yeah the the bon vivants reached out to me personally um through some connections and, you know, somebody, somebody along the way had suggested me. So, you know, it all kind of circles back to that, you know, you never, you never know when and where you might meet somebody that will uh, eventually put your name in, in the hat for something. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I didn't even know that they were looking for somebody in Denver. So it really, um, it was a great opportunity that came straight to, into my inbox. Um, Which is amazing. And that's how it eventually as, as it works, as you build your career and, and you're putting yourself out there as people do eventually start looking for you. And I think the biggest things, you know, I always like to tell people like the biggest thing in life is like, just don't be a dick. Yeah. <laughs> and you ladies yeah. are both so lovely. It's like, you know, people, it's like a life lesson. It seems so uh, obvious, but there are many people who don't follow that yeah. same uh, motto. Um, <laughs> well, like, it's follow? like, <laughs> it's like, um, I have this weird thing where like, like, 
I'm a very defensive driver. If somebody like cuts me off, like I will, I will honk at you. Like I will tell that you, that you've done something wrong. I'm obviously not going to like yell out my window and like freak out, but like, if you, you know, I'll honk at you. Um, but if I'm like driving to work and I have a meeting, I will not honk at somebody because I've like, in my head, I'm like terrified that I'll honk at the person that I'm having a meeting with. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's like so totally funny. irrational. Yes. Like I'm like, I have to be on my best behavior. I'm going to a meeting, like no honking at anybody because like, what if you it's honk also at the like, person? I think you also just never know when you're being interviewed, like throughout yes. life, yeah. right? So yeah. who, who's to say that like, you know, uh, just being on focus on health doesn't, isn't what provides us with opportunities or it is. Yeah. And it's such an interesting thing. Cause like with the virtual world, it's almost not as forgiving as real life because things are recorded. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. I actually, um, I, the first time I met Alex day, he was my judge for speed rack in Denver. Like oh, wow. I had, I had not met Alex or Dave or Devin. Um, I hadn't met any of them. I'd only met no, I hadn't even met Tyson, hadn't met a single one of them. And um, I wasn't even nervous for speed rack until a couple of days before. And I found out he was going to be my judge. And wow. then I was like nauseous. Um, but <laughs> I, I treated that entire day like an interview. I did not drink. Um, I was stone cold sober the entire competition. Um, and, you know, I, I think he would probably say as well that even though he knew who I was going into this because my name had been sent their way, um, I, I'm sure he would say that that competition had a lot to do with them yeah, wanting to I'm hire sure. me. People are always judging you. It's something I tell people. They're always judging you. Like if I go to your bar and you are the bartender and I see the fact that you're getting hammered behind your bar and you don't take your job seriously. And then later on a brand ambassador role comes up or any job and they're like, Hey, would you recommend me? I'm like, no, I'm like, no, yeah. I'm like, I can't. I'm like, I'm not going to judge you. Like I know everyone's everyone's in the once in a while gets fucked up that's okay. But when I see it as a consistent behavior or you just don't put in the extra, or I'm watching you yeah, because people come to me all the time for recommendations all the time. They're like, Hey, Elaine, can yeah. you send us a few people? Cause they trust my judgment. And so I, now I look for that. Like, are you a person who's an asshole? Are you measured? Are you a person who gives back? Are you like, what are you looking for? You know, are the, goes the extra mile. So you're always on. So it was very wise of you. And it's so funny thing, Alex Day, like I met Alex when he was just a kid. He, really was. he was such a kid and he was the bar back at Death and Company in New York City. And he really wanted to be the bartender there. And he worked really hard. And now look at him. He's the owner, you know, one of the owners. That's amazing. Yeah. I love stories like that. Yeah. So it is an incredible thing. So tell me, so now you're both working, you have part-time roles for C-Lip. So what appealed to you? about the brand, like, you know, because you need to love a brand in order to be a brand ambassador. It's very hard to promote something you don't like. So Lauren, I'll let you go first. What, what appealed to you about the brand? Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting because prior to taking this position, I told myself after working for Bell Mead, which was such an amazing company, I was like, listen, I had such an amazing experience. They're very good people. They treated me well. And I was very driven and passionate about the product. If I ever work for another brand, I have to feel the same way. So for me with CLIP, it really was just like, it's a company that is very thoughtful in their approach and their process. You know, really getting a chance to learn the story about the product and the history behind it was really, really just great. And then additionally, the team and the team members are amazing people and individuals um, who are also very passionate about nature, the environment, um, and really just providing the food and beverage um, uh, field and, you know, community with an opportunity to, to shift their lens in the way that they think about their approach to NA beverages or low ABV beverages. Um, Which is great. All right, where are your seed lip bottles? Huh? Where are your seed lip oh, bottles? I, like, okay, they're in my other room. <laughs> go, go, I'm going to talk to Alex. You go get your bottles. Go, you need to pimp your bottles. You have to be you know, brand ambassador always. So go put your thing on, Alex. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, kind of contrary to what LP said, um, after working for Bell Mead, which uh, not in not contrary, absolutely adore them. They are, um, they, they will always be family to me. And um, I still drink Bell Mead at the end of my shift, like when I'm cl <laughs> cleaning the bar, like it is my whiskey, like, you know, everybody around town knows that that's my usual. Um, but 
well, it was a really good learning experience for me working for them because I realized that I don't really like sales. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that, and I, you know, actually after working for them, I was like, I'm probably never going to be a brand ambassador again. Like I'll not, I'll not go for one of those roles, even though there's a lot that's very compelling about a larger brand ambassador role where you maybe have a salary and a budget and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, I just was like, it's just not for me. And so when I got this email from the Bon Vivants about Seedlip, I was a little hesitant um, because I knew that I, that my first experience um, wasn't something that I super loved. Um, but I hopped on the call with our uh, manager uh, for the Bon Vivants and um, we chatted through the role and the expectations. And after talking with her, I felt a lot more comfortable and confident. Um, and I also took some time and recognized within myself that since, since the three years have passed that I worked that job. I, I know my market better. I'm, I'm better known within my market. Um, and I would ha probably have a lot more success than I did, um, in that, than that first job. Um, but as far as Seedlip is concerned, um, uh, very similar to what LP said, like I, it's a, it's a brand that I've really respected and loved, um, from the beginning. And I've had the pleasure of working with Seedlip for almost three years now. So I already felt very confident and familiar with all of their products. And, um, and on top of that, you know, the working for death and co has really been the first time that I've gotten to make really incredible non-alcoholic cocktails. Um, I've never worked at a bar that put that much effort and time mm -hmm. and thought into making amazing non-alcoholic cocktails. So, you know, I have this really newfound like love of drink, of making cool non-alcoholic alcoholic cocktails. Like if I was going to like champion some drinks on our menu, like the ones that would come to mind first are our non-alcoholics. They're so cool. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, the, and that's all, because they've come a long way. I mean, I think about when non-alcoholic cocktails came, they were just like, you know, it was a lot of citrus and, and syrup yeah. and stuff like that. Well, so and like bartenders, if you want, if you want like a, if you're a bartender and you want a cool, unique challenge, like make a freaking cool non-alcoholic martini yeah, like that. That is it. hard. That like is that's, it. that's way more impressive than you making some like freaking, you know, Manhattan variation right. like who cares Ooh, like like no one cares like like you know I mean I'm not saying nobody cares they are very cool there's delicious ones everyone is very innovative and that's amazing but Nobody's like man make me you. a cool make good. me a cool make me a cool non-alc like that's hard especially yeah. balanced and like one you know that there's just so much more that you can do than I ever would have imagined like for sure you and how does Seedlip give that? Because I, I have had Seedlip drinks, uh, and so they do play different roles, right? There's three different flavors. There's yeah. three expressions. Yeah. And I mean, my favorite part about the Seedlip expressions, and something that I think a lot of people actually don't realize, as I was talking with my partner about this when I was um, asking him to bring them into his bars, was that they're not meant to be replications of spirits. Like there's plenty, there's a handful of non-alcoholic brands on the market now that are actually like a non-alcoholic gin, a non-alcoholic mm -hmm. tequila, whatever it may be, which is really cool. But the the point of Seedlip is not to be that, it's to be unique flavor profiles and unique expressions that um, that speak to terroir and they speak to um, to earth and yeah. and just really beautiful flavors. So. LP, I'll let you talk through the. Yeah, so I was like, what bottles did you grab? That For sure, I I grabbed my garden, which you know I'm oh, not so favorite, to. but I it's unbiased. But what's really cool about the expressions is that there's six primary botanicals in each expression, and each botanical go, goes through its own process, and that's for two reasons: one, to ensure that we're being consistent with the, the end product, and then two, to ensure that we're getting the highest concentration of flavor that we can possibly get. Um, so just to give you an example, with the garden, the most prominent flavor we have is green peas. So we take the pea, we freeze it at its peak, and then we have the we make the botanical essentially into pellets. Um, so concentrated flavor, right? Uh, so that the consistency in the surface is the same. And then we, in order to get the maximum flavor, um, we you know we distill it at neutral green, with a neutral grain spirit, and then through the best way to explain how we extract the alcohol, the reason it's called a non-alcoholic distilled spirit is because it is distilled, it is a spirit, but we're extracting the alcohol out um, mm -hmm. via temperature because water and boil are obviously boiling at different temperatures, right? Right. Um, so with the garden here, our herbal expression 108, I'm still trying to remember the numbers because there's just they're tied into every every expression, but um, 108 is the average number of days it takes to sow um, peace. 
Um, and so we have English peas, we have hay, rosemary, thyme, spearmint, and hops in this one. Very nice. Um, Actually, I like that one. That's the one yeah. I love. Yeah, I really That's like my it. favorite one too. And I was like telling my tattoo artist about it last time I was getting tattooed. And I was like, yeah, it's like hay and pea. And she was like, that's <laughs> gross. And I was like, no, it's like really good. And she's like, you got to find a different way to describe it. I'm like, but those are what in is in it. And so I've started saying spa water um, or like an east side in a bottle. I think yeah. that those are helpful. Yeah, it, there's so many approaches and different ways to like pitch this to people because if you have like a person who's all about environmental wellness and nature you have your pitch right there if you have someone who's interested in incorporating a you know a, a, a more complex element in their na beverages you have your approach there so you have to kind of gauge what the person's looking for but right. And um, how, the, how they're coming to the table. By the way, you look like angelic right now because just the sunlight. I know. Is shining. <laughs> so, I'm, the sun it's and kind it's of just, coming in. It's that like, prime time like, right now like, where the sun uh, is just like, yeah, in like 30 minutes, it's just going to be like dark, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Very, uh, yeah, it's like I'm looking at you and you're, you're, you're shining. Um, okay, so there is a difference. So, uh, as a bar owner, what should I have? Like, what did I write? What should I have sea lip? Why should I have sea lip on my menu? That's kind of what you were explaining, right? Like, so you can add different variations. Yeah. You know, I think my answer to that question is, uh, what, uh, another reason why I took this job is because I get to educate and teach people about new and personalized ways to approach NA beverages. And what I mean by that is, I think it's a really great way to provide someone with a, and it's a very similar experience as you would provide someone who is drinking. So one, taking into consideration where you're placing this on the menu. If it's in the back of the menu where the kids' drinks are, you're probably going to feel as if this was an afterthought, right? right. Two, if you're giving me a non-alcoholic beverage and the glass that the kids get their drinks or a glass <laughs> that's not as decadent or pretty as the other ones, I'm probably, again, like, we don't want to make anyone who is not drinking for whatever the reason may be feel as if what we're providing them with and what they are paying for more importantly is an afterthought right um up is not cheap it is it's you know it's actually fairly affordable but it's just it's it's more than that it's really just like think about it there's a difference between cost and value and i really think that what's important to acknowledge is somebody took the time to produce this product whether it be wine and beer, whatever it is. So we want to we want to pay our respect by producing something that's delicious and that really is you know doing it justice. So taking that. No, absolutely. Scene, I'm not saying it's too. I was just saying like if no, I'm no, for sure. a non-alcoholic cocktail, I better get a drink that makes oh me absolutely. Really good and, a, absolutely and a beautiful glass, and I'm getting the same because you're paying. Oh yeah. Whatever, oh, yeah. you're paying almost the same as you would for an alcoholic cocktail. So um, yeah. I'm assuming Cedar brings, and I have had. See the drinks that, you know, they're definitely more complex. You're definitely, I, I'm tasting something interesting. It isn't too, it isn't like the sweet yeah. savory drinks I've gotten for non-alcoholic, which it, which is really nice. So like, what's yeah. your go-to cocktail with Sila for yourself? Do you have I do, I do like a Collins variation with the garden. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when we're focusing on flavor, we're, we're really successful in what we can do. Like you can, I mean, there's so many different things. You can make like a lemon oleo with some herbs. I was doing that during the summertime, like I had a bunch of mint, so I made like a lemon herb oleo and then just, you know, some uh, some fresh lemon juice or even like San Pellegrino that has lemon flavor in it and um, just going to town with my seed lip garden. <laughs> <laughs> and Alex, you have a favorite? Um, you know, for me personally, Honestly, my favorite Seedlip drink is the one that we have on the menu at Death & Co. right now, which is, a, it's like a pina colada martini mm -hmm. variation. So it reads like a pina colada, but it's a martini and it's uh, Seedlip spice and Seedlip growth. It's got pineapple gum syrup, a little lime oleosaccharum, white verjus and coconut extract. And that's all oh. stirred. And it's actually inspired by an alcoholic cocktail of the same name. Um, that's a pina colada gin martini. Um, but it, you know, I think one of my favorite things to make for people when they, if they look at the menu and they want something non-alcoholic, but they, that nothing really calls to them that we have available. Uh, one of my go-tos is a non-alcoholic Floridora uh, with seed lip spice, raspberry, ginger, lime, and seltzer. Um, because like, I remember when we were training, when we did our first trainings for Duff & Co, we were talking about cocktails and Tyson was just like, Floridora, 
everybody loves it. There's not a person in the world that doesn't like a Floridora. It's for everybody. Everyone loves it. And so that's kind of like, like I just was like, okay, well, like not all Floridora, everybody loves it, which is true. It's like spicy. <laughs> it's a little sweet. Um, it's tart. It's delicious. Um, and I, you know, one other thing that I really like to do because once again, it's like prior to working at Death & Co, I never would have like thought to be as adventurous as I am now. So like even in a non-alcoholic clover club, with mm-hmm. soup of spice, like, oh, yeah. and putting, putting that. egg white in there, like, it's delightful, like, it's still really good, like, you don't have to have, like, gin in there to have an egg white drink, so I like, I like to kind of push the boundaries a little bit and make very, a drink look like a cocktail. Very nice. Yeah, I think that if, if anybody has listened to the most recent No Proof podcast episode that had Josh Harris on it, they were talking about non-alcoholic drinks and why they're so important, he just put it the best way, like, he just said, like, you know, everyone deserves to feel like respected and comfortable when they're ordering a drink, regardless of if it has alcohol in it or not. So no, I think that's, that is a very valid point. So I'll end with, um, well, those two questions. One, so as a part-time brand ambassador, um, everybody has different uh, things that they have to do. So you said something to me, you have key impressions, which mm-hmm. is definitely a new uh, terminology. I have I have never heard use in that role. I always heard KPIs, which are key key performance indicators. So key impre- So tell like, what is your responsibility right now as a, as a part-time brand ambassador? Yeah, so there are technically eight things that we can fall within um, as far as being able to meet the requirements um, for every month, but it can be right now. And, and the thing that's great about Seedlip too is that they've been very accommodating and understanding with the circumstances in the current times. Mm-hmm. So um, it can be virtual events, you know, maybe something like this, or um, we do something called Seedlip Social Hour on Focus on Health. So, you know, creating something like that. Um, doing tastings in person, um, you know, getting a new account in person, um, a cocktail menu placement, um, getting a new, you know, oh, we're doing some off-premise account work as well. So some liquor stores, so getting, you know, a liquor store to bring in the product, uh, mm-hmm. or, you know, boutiques, uh, plant shops. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. really the, that's the coolest part about getting to work for Seedlip and working for a non-alcoholic brand is that, uh, we have such a larger market that we can work for. So like LP was saying, like, I have some boutiques in Denver that I absolutely love that are really amazing women owned and um, that Seedlip would do really well in. And so like, I've reached out to them to be like, Hey, would you think about carrying this? You know, it's like your, your favorite local coffee shop. You could be like, Hey, would you think about what about doing like a seasonal espresso cocktail with some spice? Like there's really, there's the, just, there's such a larger um, playing field, which is really fun and cool. And you can do such cool, like, events with like a flower shop do a wreath making class when we're allowed to be in public in together and, like, and you know yeah there's just a lot that we can do which is fun no that 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 actually sounds great I've never heard the the uh, goals being put together and I think that's kind of fair it's like eight things you know that you have to do and put together and it can be a variety and it kind of takes the anxiety off because you know you have full-time jobs and you're, you're doing other things so I think that's uh I think that's, I think that's a really cool way uh, of managing a brand ambassador and inspiring them to get out there and be creative as well, um, which is great. So I guess the last question is for, just to wrap it up, if you had any last words of advice you want to give somebody looking to become a brand ambassador, what would it be? Um, I think for me, just make sure it's a brand that you truly care about and that you are comfortable, you know, being placed in a position where you can obviously sell it. If you, you know, that's with anything you do, right? If you're competing, if you're getting a new job, um, don't do it just to do it. I think that we should really just ensure that everything is aligned with what we do and it will at the end of the day, make us way better employees. And I, I honestly believe it provides us with a, a little bit more completeness as well uh, as individuals. So um, yeah, just make sure you love what you do. I think that's great advice. Alex, anything from you? Oh man, I'll be really nailed it about loving what you do. I think we've all probably worked in like restaurants where you just, the bar program was great, but you really didn't believe in the food or like vice versa. And like, you know, that's so hard, like dreading going to work every day because you don't believe in it. So yeah, obviously like believing in what you do and believing in the product that you sell. Um, and then I think I just would like to circle back to the the quick conversation we had about like always being on, like you, you never know 
who you're talking to and you never know who's watching. And that's not to say that you can't be authentically you. You should always be authentically you and speak your mind and don't be afraid, but do it in a way that, yeah, do it in a way that is respectful and, um, and open to, to learning rather than, um, immediately, uh, defensive or negative or whatever it may be. Uh, just be you and don't be a dick. (laughs) (laughs) That's my motto in life. Just don't be a dick. Well, ladies, this has been awesome. Um, I have no idea. I think it's on Facebook now, but if not, I'm going to put it up there. So for any of you watching, thank you so much for tuning in. This will happen every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Hopefully it will get smoother as time goes on. But it's been a pleasure talking to uh, Alex Jump and LP Lauren Paler from Sea Lips. So uh, thanks again. And if you miss any of this, I also put them on my website, Duff on the Rocks, uh, where all the episodes are there for you to watch at any time. So ladies, thank you again for all your time. It's been a pleasure. And I look forward to seeing you in person in 2021. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.